<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of the Rams Review podcast. Uh, today, as mentioned out on social media yesterday, we are joined by uh, Derby County Women's, as they're now called. Uh, Hannah, Hannah, uh, it's great to have you with us. Yeah, thank you very much, Jason. I really appreciate the time, and I'm glad that I can uh, give you a hand. You give you guys a hand and see what see what uh, see what we can talk about. No problem. And as obviously as always, I am joined with Corey. Corey, hello. Jason, how you doing? Hello. Yeah, good, nice to meet you. you. Cool. So um, I think obviously today, um, as most people uh, will not notice, we're actually recording this slightly over a different platform. So uh, hopefully the audio is all good and my editing skills are a lot better than I think they are. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll roll with it, we'll roll with it. So, um, for, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, the, the way that this is just going to roll, we are going to, uh, unfortunately, Hannah, we're going to actually just allow you to just talk uh, and we're just going to listen okay. uh, for a lot of it. Um, <laughs> it didn't, didn't tell me that before I came along, but that's no. okay. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I've got, obviously, being in and around Derby, um, I've, you hear, you, certainly over the last um, 12 to 18 months, I know, You've obviously only been with uh, the Derby ladies for, since the beginning of this season. Um, the, the the rise of the women's game, for, certainly for the Derby team just recently, is, um, is is really starting to come to the front. I know the partnership with obviously the men's team seems to be getting stronger and stronger um, as well. So there's a lot more uh, opportunity uh, and obviously media coverage. It, se it seems to be on on media platforms um, from the main men's team. Um, just one of the first questions I want to ask you, do, do you, and obviously the, the girls think that that seems to be the case, you know, it's, you're getting a bit more recognised for your own um, achievements, certainly obviously just before this season got ended, uh, unfortunately, I believe you were sit, sitting second. Um, yeah, we were, yeah. So, you know, that that's unfortunate. Um, and another one of the questions we're going to go on to in a little bit later is hopefully you can explain the women's football pyramid a little bit better than I managed to try and read on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a little bit confusing at times. Um, but yeah, I mean, do, do you think, obviously, as I say, I know you've only been around for eight, nine months at Derby, but do you think that the women's game's grown, certainly at Derby in the last eight, nine months that you've been there and anything that any of your um, teammates have said anything to you about? Yeah, I mean, I've played in the same league as Derby for, you know, for a few years because I was only across the pond really at Stoke. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, you know, played against Derby and they've always, they've always been tough nuts really. They've always been class as well. You know, they're a very professional club that, you know, um, with the, you can tell that they sort of have a back and they go about things really professionally in the way that they do sort of on and off the pitch. Um, and I think talking to the girls and even obviously my own experience in Derby that the... Um, the backing of the men's team, you know, has been really, really apparent from like previous clubs that have been in at say a lower level rather than, you know, up at the WSR. I think the backing that the Derby have got now is uh, is quite immense really. And it's I don't think many clubs in our league will sort of have that facilities and have that, you know, financial backing that we do. You know, we get a chance to play at Pie Park, you know, you get you get paid for what you do kind of thing, you know, and it's it's yeah. not it's not nowhere near the men's team, but you know, there's there's many teams out there that don't really get any of that, and um, and you can see like Duncan, he's the CEO of you know the, the women's, and he works, you know, he works really really hard, and he he comes to all the games, and you don't really usually get that. It's usually you know the guy behind the scenes does all of it, and you don't really see them like appearance wise, but he's there, you know, every game, away games, home games, you know, and you can see what you can see what it means to the girls and I'm glad that I've been able to sort of adapt myself to that and kind of like, you know, jump on board with the, you know, the financial backing of, of the, um, that the men's give us, you know, we get a chance to go to, we get free tickets to the men's games. We do like um, Q and A's on in the men's games, you know, two of us go at each, each, each home game and we get to pick which ones like we go to and we get, you know, the players lounge and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really good setup to be involved in. Yeah, uh, to be fair, that was obviously one of the questions. Obviously, as certainly I've uh, been lucky enough to go around uh, Moor Farm. Um, so, are, are the women allowed? Obviously, are they using the facilities at Moor Farm as well? And obviously, as you say, I, I do know that you have played on, on Pride Park a couple of times at least. Um, but obviously, like you say, if you are getting to use those facilities, that that really must be a big difference to a lot of women's teams, probably even up in the up in the Premiership. To be fair. Yeah, to be fair, you know, like I've been involved in the women's game now, you know, talking 15, 20 years and like, 
um, from where I started, you know, kind of grassroots, it's, uh, it, you do get to use the facilities. We, we do train at Moor Farm, you know, and we get access to all sort of the gym side to it. And um, you, you see the odd player around here and there sometimes. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, not, all, it's not always what all, you know, the teams in our league, unfortunately, don't always get the access to that. But we're fortunate, you know, because, you know, a lot of the people behind the scenes have worked hard for us to be able to do that which yeah. is really, really good, you know, and it, and it kind of makes you feel as that the women's that you're part of it a little bit, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that you're not streets, streets apart. Um, obviously, like the things like attendance and stuff, you kind of are streets apart from it, but they do make you feel like, you know, it's one club and they've kind of created that ethos around Derby County now that it's sort of one club and, you know, they do help us out as much as, much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Corey? Yeah, so Hannah, in addition to, um, you know, having that one club ethos and everything and, um, all the things you just mentioned. What were the other kind of driving factors to bring you to bring you from Stoke to Derby? Um, yeah, so um, I think it was the back end of last summer. Sam, you know, the manager sort of contacted me, and uh, I was kind of thinking, could could I go? Could I go somewhere else? I, I'd done a couple of years at Stoke, and um, I kind of wanted to sort of, you know, see test my horizons and see where I could be. And Sam sort of, you know, she sort of mentioned the caliber of players that she'd already got, which I kind of knew playing against Derby you know and I knew they'd got they um had some players that are injured so I knew she was trying to like create a big a bigger picture of like more new players and she sort of like dropped a few names in there and you know there was few players that did sign exactly the same time as me that I kind of knew you know I kind of knew on a football level and sort of a personal level as well so um and I know Sam is you know Sam Sam played the game for many years now so you know she kind of she knows exactly what she's talking about and she kind of sold it pretty much within one phone call. I think we had a couple, but I think once I had a conversation with my dad, I think that was kind of it. I think I was pretty sold on, you know, that I wanted to go to Derby, you know, I wanted to have a new challenge, you know, new players sort of fresh myself up a little bit and see what we could do. And I have really enjoyed my first, my first season there. So could you walk us through, obviously when we see a, a player get signed um, at any level, uh, the men's game, the women's game, youth level or whatever, we just say, you know, player X is joining team, team Y or whatever. Could you kind of walk us through what it was like for you as a player and how the interest came about and how everything kind of tied together to get the deal over the line? Yeah. See, this is, uh, this is, this is one that people don't know much, probably don't know much about, you know, how you kind of go about it, what, you kind of can't do when you contract then somewhere else can you speak to or you're poaching or you're kind of doing that thing with the women game it's especially with our league being the third tier that it, it is kind of a little bit different you know I think I think it classes from the first of June that sort of everybody's a free agent you know every player is sort of because you don't sign a professional contract you're sort of a free agent from the first of June so to be honest with you from the 1st of June this year was my phone didn't stop for a good couple of days, you know, and it was, you know, I was a bit touch and go here, you know, here, there and everywhere. I wasn't really sure. I spoke to a couple of clubs, you see, but it, that is sort of the process. You're sort of a free agent. You're not tied to any club. You know, you can sort of commit yourself to where you want to be if you want to be at the same club or you, you do want to go differently. And it was sort of, I had a couple of clubs. Sam came in a little bit later on, actually. She sort of uh, came a little bit afterwards and um she just sort of said you know I was the type of player she was kind of looking for she wanted to get a goal scorer as she called as she classed me as um to get to get in there from last season because they sort of lacked in that department I think a little bit last year um so we sort of had that phone call and I think I was pretty sold you know I did did make her sweat a little bit I think I didn't. I didn't say yes straight away, but I did make her sweat a little bit. I think, but I think I knew. I kind of knew what I was doing there. But yeah, and it was. You know, I kind of spoke to the other clubs that I'd been in touch with and just give them that respect that you know that I was, I was moving on to somewhere. And then I did speak to the Stoke manager. You know, I'd known Chloe for years at Stoke, so I did kind of let her know and give that respect that I was kind of moving on. And you know, she just obviously wished me well. That's kind of how easy it is within our level. You know, there's you have respect for the club that you play for, but there's not, you know, you don't, and you have loyalty to that, but you don't, you're not really crossing paths. You're not really doing much wrong poaching or anything like that. But so, yeah, that was the transition. And then I think um, I met with Sam at Pride Park actually. And we, you know, you get to sit where they are, where um, Koku has his, um, or Lampard at the time, I think it, it was. He, uh, you have the, um, uh, press conferences and stuff so I did all that put my shirt up and that and then it 
it blows on social media and then you kind of go from there really it's funny you mentioned uh what Seth did you said. did you hear any of that i did okay that's okay that's cool yeah, I noticed uh, you say that Sam uh, Griffiths said that you were, she, she quoted you as saying she, you're a prolific striker because you scored 26 and 29 for Stoke uh, the previous season. Um, and, and you're obviously, uh, goal scoring record for Derby is quite good with uh, 14 appearances, 13 goals, I think it is. Um, so what makes, what makes you as a mentality for a striker to, to go out there and, and to try to get them goals? What, what drives you on to get that? And then what does it take mentally to be able to convert those opportunities into goals? I think um, when somebody gives you that title when they want to sign you, you know, you sort of add that little bit of pressure and think, yeah, I have done it elsewhere. It's now like I've got to do it here because that's what I'm kind of here for. So I think when something, somebody labels you without giving it too much pressure to yourself, you know, you kind of go into a game sort of, you know, overconfident sometimes you know because if you don't have that confidence as well it, it you know it can affect your performance it, it sort of affects your concentration so um I think just the drive is that I just want to better myself really and you know kind of show people why I am here you know you get strikers even in the men's game that sort of can be inconsistent you know they can score and then they might have a couple of seasons out but when you're playing at a high level as what I am I think it's important that it you know you kind of you have to keep doing it every season because that's kind of what, what you're there for. I mean, like, I'm still only 26, as people say. I'm still only 26. But, you know, I can't guarantee it will happen when I'm 30. But, you know, if I can keep kind of doing it now. Um, yeah, so just the motivation, you know, the, the girls are great, you know. And, you know, the goals that I always score, I, you know, I couldn't do it without my teammates really either, you know. So it is, is a massive team effort. But I do strive myself, to, you know, I do try and push myself to you know be scoring one or two a game and if I don't you know pick yourself back up and you know you don't want to have that feeling again that you didn't but if the team win at the end of the day that's kind of that's kind of the goal but everybody does have their own individual goals in their own you know in their pocket that they don't always share but yeah I do have that but I don't put too much pressure on myself either. I know what I would give to just be 26 again eh? Usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah ever so slightly. Um yeah. Obviously, you were saying there, uh, again, I, I, real apologies for not knowing uh, enough about the women's game at all. Um, <laughs> very interesting about the, the contracts thing. Obviously, Corey, you probably um, no, notice more about that kind of thing. It's almost as a, as a draft-style American kind of thing. So, obviously, you know yes. damn yeah. more about that than I will. Um, is, that, not... is that the same right up the, up the board? So, even up to the Women's Premier Premier League, Super League or whatever, sorry, what it's called. No, no. No, it's a bit it, different it's, up there. It's different because I think a lot of that is, you know, sort of full-time football. Yeah. That's, you know, their kind of daytime thing. They have lunch there, I'm guessing, and, you know, kind of all that. So, yeah, there is definitely contracts there because a lot of them play at international level, which they'll have contracts at as well. So yeah. that's not across the board. And I think, I think many of the championship teams are pretty much there now, sort of full-time, but I don't think all of them are. But I do right. think over half of them in the championship now are kind of at that level where contracts are being thrown out and that's kind of full time and, you know, that's kind of all that they do. Yeah. But it's a, little, it's a little bit different when it gets to the Premier League. It's sort of, you know, we still have full time jobs. We still have families, you know, we have yeah. partners and stuff that, you know, they are very good on the social aspect of life. They're very understanding that, you know, that you have families and you do, you know, I work full time as well. So, yeah, it can be quite demanding as well. But, um, yeah, it's different across the board. Unfortunately, it is different across the board, yeah. But that's why you'll probably get a lot of the women are so passionate about football because we do it because we love it. You know, I've yeah, still, yeah. still got to work full-time to provide for my family, you know, with my home and stuff. So I still, you know, it's just the passion and the desire that makes you do it rather than you know, money side to it. It's it, it's more of a bonus that, you know, that Derby are in that situation where they can financially fund us as players and as well as a club. But, you know, I still have to work. And I know all of the girls that, that, are, that are basically all in our league really still have to work or they're at full-time uni or, you know, it's sort of, you'll get a lot of passion and love with uh, the women's game. 
Yeah, I mean, as I say, as, as I mentioned earlier, it, it does seem that certainly back in from from behind the scenes, as I say, how much quite the men's uh, setup is helping this. I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure, but obviously it seems that the 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 people behind the scenes at Derby Women's they, they do obviously want to perspire to to get up as as high as up the pyramid as they possibly can. Um, I mean, I can probably think back. Uh, probably it's probably four or five years now, so probably around about the beginning, probably of your career, Anna, when you was uh, starting out. I mean, to be fair, that Dar- the Derby, uh, the women's team, really was very, very unknown. Very, it, it was there. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but it, it, there was not a great deal. And as I say, it just seems it's it's been like a bit of a, a bit of a ro- a bit of a steam train just just coming coming through. And as I say, you certainly there's a lot more advertising around Pride Park yeah. now for yourselves. Obviously, as I say, yeah. you're sharing the facilities, which is obviously going to help. Um, it, it's obviously something that the people who, who run the run the ladies um, are obviously, as I say, aspiring to get up as high as they possibly can. Yeah. How how high and where do you think they might be in a couple of years' time? I mean, you know, it was sort of the drive that got me to the club as well. You know, Duncan and Sam and the, the rest of the guys behind the scenes sort of, you know, want to get to that level of, you know, being in the championship, being in the WSL. That's kind of what they strive for. And I think because the backing that they've had from the club, it's not... It's it's not an unrealistic goal anymore than mm. what it used to be, you know, a couple of years ago when we were sort of, you know, women's football was a bit of roller coaster, and I think now it's become realistic, and I think it probably just gives the drive to, you know, the uh, the people behind the scenes and stuff to kind of push that because they know it's kind of realistic now, and um, yeah, so it's um, it's good times, and I know. I know we are striving for that because, you know, realistically on the pitch, we've got the players and the fact that we've got the backing. And I think you do, there's some sort of financial you have to put in to get to the next league. I'm not 100% down with it. I'm not, you know, I'm not massively clued up, but I think you do have to have some kind of funds behind you for you to participate in the league above, which sounds all a little bit crazy to me because I'm just more bog standard promotion relegation that's kind of where you're at but unfortunately for women's games it's just a little bit yeah and, and obviously as I say just before everything did seem to um, obviously got cancelled unfortunately personally uh, I know me and Corey mentioned it um, a few weeks ago <laughs> Um, that obviously your the, the women's game was one of the first ones for the chop which I, I find a little bit frustrating in some respects it, it, it doesn't give you the respect that I think it probably deserves um, yeah. and obviously it, it builds up I mean I was we was talking that um, a, a friend of mine owns a, a men's non-league uh, team uh, in, in in the local area I mean we're talking ninth tenth tier of yeah men's game but they own it and they they were pushing for promotion to the to the ninth tier for the first ever time uh, they were top with about five, six games to go of their league. They were absolutely coasting it. They null and voided all non-league football, obviously, along with yourselves. And, I mean, we were talking, this particular division, I think it was Hereford United were in it only two years ago. Oh, right, OK. So oh, right, okay. they were competing last year against those. They beat them to the title, as you would expect, with the amount of money that they had behind them. And then they thought that they'd done a really good job of getting there yeah. uh, this season for it just to be null and void. Obviously, yourselves, you were second. Um, <laughs> it must be frustrating that it became null and void. As you say, I appreciate it might not have been in the circumstances that you would have got promoted in that case or gone up a division anyway. But it's clear to see, as you've well said, you, you believe that you're good enough on the pitch. And by the sounds of it, results and performances and how, how you were in the table kind of proves that, yeah, you, you, you probably can mix it at a, a level above. Yeah, I think... Um... Going into the season, you know, I think Sam only sort of managed to keep 50% of the squad from last year. So we always kind of knew it was going to be difficult bringing in, I think, she was eight or nine. But that's just the number I picked off the top of my head. New players into sort of the system. Unfortunately, she had quite a few injuries in the back end of last year. So she's had to sort of change personnel a little bit. Um, so, yeah, um, it was a little bit disappointing. But I think as a women's footballer that's been in the game for as long as I have, it does doesn't come as a surprise. Unfortunately, you know, I'm, mm. a bit real, I'm a bit realistic when it comes to women's football. People always say, don't say that, don't say that. But I end up being right all the time. There, there, was, there was always, it was inevitable that we were going to get, you know, kind of cut down. And I, and I don't like to say that, but it, it always kind of happens. And unfortunately, like a team in our league has actually, actually folded, which is filed. 
they've actually folded in our league uh, because of this. You know, the men's the men's file team are in the conference north, I think it is. And, yeah, I think um, they are. Yeah, I think they were yeah. flying pretty high in that as well, actually. Yeah, I think they were right. third, but unfortunately, yeah. filed women filed women who used to be pressed in off end. You know, they, right. they had such should, such good back, and you know, comrades kind of took them really where they needed to be. And I knew some of the players personally, and like, you know, it's really unfortunate that with all this kind of going on that the women's team they decided to got kind of got cut first so yeah um going back to us yeah it's kind of unfortunate that the season sort of ended when it did as as prior like before christmas we we weren't great you know there was we slipped a lot quite a few points that maybe we shouldn't have done but again you know we were a brand new team pretty much you know just trying to gel and i think it kind of took us longer than what we thought you know i think and then after Christmas, God, we were just rolling, yeah. you know. I think we didn't lose in eight or nine games and we were you know, we were really putting the performances into into winning, you know, we didn't drop any points. I think we only lost one game and I think that was in the cup. That was the Sunderland who were top of the league. So um yeah, it does come unfortunate. I don't think we were probably in a position that we were gonna get, you know, kind of promoted. And that's where I kind of my heart goes out to Sunderland, you know, it's uh it's very difficult for them to kind of take on board that they have, you know, really not run away with the league, but they, you know, they, they're a good side and they've got plenty of points to, to gain promotion. And I think, you know, your heart does go out to them people that have kind of put all that effort in, you know, and they work full time as well. You know, it, it is hard and, you know, their away games are pretty far away from where we are. Yeah, I, I, so I've seen some of the teams in, in your league. They, oh, they no. really are some, they're, they're good away trips every week. I know, and I can't imagine, you know, like being up in Sunderland, how like how much like weekends they've dedicated away from their family and away from yeah. their work to work around to to able to come come down to us or you know anywhere in the Midlands to play. So your heart does kind of go out to them, you know, that they've but they've acted like nothing but class and professional about the decision. You know, at the end of the day, people's health and people's lives are are more important. But um, we were just a tad little disappointed just because we found that run that we thought, you know, we might have had before Christmas. But it came after Christmas now, unfortunately, this happened. But we're hoping, you know, keep without injuries, 90%, 100% of the players that we hope to keep for next season. And that hopefully, will, you know, add one or two fresh faces. You know, I don't see why we can't really, really push. And I know that Sam's aim and I know Duncan would have given that, Sam that aim for next year without a doubt, is for that top spot. He's a man that doesn't mess about. He does a lot of work. So, Hannah, that brings me um, to kind of my next set of questions is, how are you and your family holding up during the crisis? And are you able to communicate with your teammates? And how is morale in and amongst the, the squad and the camp? Yeah, I think um, I, um, I still work full time, you see. I'm classed as a key worker, as they call them. So I still have my full-time job. I look after disabled people. So it's sort of business as usual for me, you know. They're still living in independent living. or um, So I've still got to go to the house. I've, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to strip myself to one house. Um, so I only go to one house to look after one person. I'm not jumping around houses, you know. But, um, yeah, it's been a little bit different, you know. Sort of rotors in my work have kind of changed around. And like living with my partner and the little girl, yeah, my partner's high risk, so I've had to be really, really careful with kind of in this in this lockdown. But um, she got tested for coronavirus and it was negative, so obviously that that's kind of all good. Um, yeah, it's just having a three year old is quite difficult. <laughs> yes, not, I is, can I can I can vouch for that. Yeah, it's um, it is quite difficult. I mean, homeschooling and stuff, you know. He's not quite at that age to start school September if if it's gonna happen. I don't really yeah. know to be honest. Um, yeah. So there's only so much television and films. But to be fair, we've actually had really nice weather, so it's actually made it that that touch a bit easier. The weather has been really really good here. There's only been a few days where we've had bad weather. I'm not sure if you know what bad weather is, Corey. <laughs> I don't quite know if you do, but it, it can we're be bad. Doing, we're certainly doing Derby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do here too. So, but it's actually been really, really nice. We've been able to go out, you know, kind of walking. I've still been kind yeah. of doing my fitness, like getting on the bike and kind of doing that. We do a few hit sessions, as they call them, uh, with the uh, strength and conditioning guy at Derby. Matt, we're all on Zoom on that on a Friday, and he does a session that we have to do in our garden, kind of thing. 
Um, Matt's really good. He's really accessible if, if there's anything that we need, you know, if we want. You know, you could have some weeks where you sort of... I had a bit of a break, to be honest. You know, after you do after a season anyway, I, I sort of concentrated on work and, like, spending time with my family and stuff. And um, then I kind of started getting my fitness back up and, you know, kind of, you know, you can't keep ticking over over the time. But, yeah, keeping safe and healthy is, is the most important thing and that's what we are doing here. And it's just thank God to the weather that I've been able to get the pool out and stuff for the little yeah, one to, to enjoy a little bit because, I mean, four walls is draining as it is. And, you know, anybody out with kids, I do take my hat off because it can be very difficult. Yeah, yeah, it, it can be. No matter what <laughs> age, no matter what age, I think, you know, all the age ranges. I mean, when they're younger, younger, it doesn't really make much. But, you know, I can imagine teenagers and little kids are exactly the same right now you know tantrums and stuff so yeah it's uh it's been quite challenging but been managed to do some fun stuff really like with my work you know there's a girl um with a disability that I look after and we're just in I'm getting her out walking so we've managed to walk just over a marathon in lockdown so far and for her that's a really good achievement so Mm -hmm. we're pushing for 100k by the end of lockdown so uh we've added to that today so we're tracking, tracking as much as we're walking with her. So uh, she's doing really well. So I enjoy doing that kind of side to it and a bit of baking, which is not really me, but I kind of just had to take it on and like, you know, do, do some with work and try and keep that busy as well, really. Yeah. And another goal for you at the end of lockdown is to be on the Great British Bake Off? Yeah. <laughs> I do not think so. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to quite fit it. I think the, um, the young girl I support, I think she teaches more than me. I think she definitely is in that kitchen taking control more than I am. I, I'm not really, I'm not a big cook and I'm not, I'm not a baker. I, I'm not, I don't think I've ever sort of taken control of that department. No, get me doing the washing and the drying and stuff. I love all that kind of stuff, weirdly, I do. But not, not a great cook and not a great baker. Yeah, no. I'm more of a, I'll eat the cakes, but I can't bake them. Yeah. I'll, go buy, I'll go buy them from the shop, yeah. That's about as far as I'll get, yeah. But I think I've got, cake to make tomorrow which i don't uh, yeah we'll see how that goes yeah so you talked a little earlier about your drive for the game um and how you see it at all the levels of the women's game obviously because of um sometimes the lack the lack of money uh in it and um where does where does your drive for the game come from so um my great grandfather uh he actually played for england um, England, funny enough, when I'm Welsh, but yeah, my great grandfather Tommy Gardner, he played for England, and he spent a lot of time at Liverpool, and he moved on to Burnley, and he kind of settled. I think he had a few spells at Aston Villa, but he moved on to Burnley and kind of settled his ways there. Um, so I think that's well, it's definitely what kind of where it's come from. And then he had um, a son, which was my granddad. Um, he he then went to sign for Liverpool when he was 19. So he um, he he played for Liverpool. He played for England, and he settled himself in Burnley as well. Um, in around World War Two, so he had many stories that he could share with me about his his base down in Burnley. And yeah, so I used to go. Unfortunately, my grand my grandma passed away in March, just gone. So just before lockdown, but we used to go, you know, go to his home, and he's got all these, you know, kind of stories to tell, and he's got all these pictures you know, kind of all black and white and newspaper articles from when he signed. And I, I'd buy a pair of boots and I'd go and take it, take to show him. And he he could never get over the fact that how light they were. Because I think they called them cleats back in his day. And he, yeah, they did. And he, he'd grab my football boots and he'd throw them in the air because he was just in complete amaze with how, how, how light they were. And he's like, how would you put them on your feet? You know, he was, yeah. So it definitely skipped a generation. I'm not, I'm really 100% sure my mother's no good. I don't think she she didn't really get the genes from her dad in that aspect. It, so it definitely did skip a generation um, with my mum. She loves to come and watch and she's always grown up with football because he used to he used to own Chester City Football Club. So she's always kind of grew up with, my, with um, her dad in the football aspect, just not really, she's not really technically good, I don't think. So it's funny you uh, knock on the international uh, kind of theme a little bit. So you, you're a Welsh international. 
Um, what was it like the first time when you got the call up for the women's team at Wales? And what was it like for the first time to, to pull on that shirt? Yeah, so I was, I, I was, uh, you sort of have like North Wales, South Wales, and they're a good four or five hour drive apart, you see. So you sort of get like the regional centres. So in North Wales, we got based up in um, somewhere here in North Wales where I'm situated and we'd all play. And uh, you then get picked from there if, you, if you're good enough to go down to kind of Cardiff, where the capital of Wales, where, um, a, you know, there was a lot more women's football kind of down there because it's a big populated area compared to up here. Um, and I think I'd have been 14, 15, I think, when I went to my first camp. So it's sort of like Wales in the 16s, you know, and you're meeting new players and you're coming out of school. And they write to your school that you've been picked to play for Wales kind of thing. And, you know, you go ahead and kind of do all of that. You have five days away from home and, you know, you kind of meet new players and stuff. And But you've got to work hard, you know. I had to do my schoolwork. A lot of my schoolwork was outside of school, really. I didn't spend too much time in school because I was here, there and everywhere. And then at the age of 16, I then got picked to go away with the under-17s. And then it just became a big circle. I, at 17, I then got picked to play for the under-17s and the under-19s. At the age of 18, I was then picked to go, well, at the age of 17, I was then asked to go to play for the first team. So I just didn't spend any time at home, any time at school. So I made my debut for the first team in Parker Scarlet in Flanethley down in South Wales. I was 17 and something like 232 days or something like that. and we played against France who were like top four in the world. You know, we were playing a European qualifier and, you know, I wasn't there to make the numbers up, but I was 17, my first camp, you know, I was in camp with the likes of Jess Fishlock, which you probably, I don't know, up in America, she's probably bigger than ever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she was on camp with me, but to me as a young 17-year-old, Jess would have been 26 maybe or something like that. I don't know, you know, 23, what, 24. It was, you know, quite daunting. I was away from my family, didn't really know, you know, many people. Um, and then it was sort of like I was getting subbed on to play in this game. And I was like, oh, didn't really expect that to kind of happen because, you know, we're playing against France, who are like top three, I think they were, which I still think they are now, in kind of in the world. And there's the likes of like... um who was playing for France at the time. There was just, you know, these players like Les Sommer was playing for France at the time. who plays for Lyon now. And then you've got Wendy Renard who plays for France. And, um, who plays obviously for France and in Lyon now who's Champions League winner however many times. So it was a little bit like, okay. But I wasn't really clued up on who was who. But I kind of knew that France were kind of up there. And I did come on. I think I played, I think I played striker at the time because I always was a centre midfielder before I joined Liverpool back in the day and they pushed me to be a striker um, and apparently I don't really know who I didn't know who this Wendy Renard was all I knew she was this well, she's got to be at least six foot three got to be um, angling centre back and I, I yeah it was a little bit daunting but actually I got the ball and I turned and I megged her and I went past her and then I got interviewed after the game and the, the guy that was interviewing me was like did you see what you did against Wendy Renard like Wendy Renard and I just went who's that like I was just this young kid I had no idea who that was but apparently she was this big big star and this whole interview was about me Megan Megan Wendy Renard and I didn't know her from Adam you know I didn't know who that was so um yeah that was very daunting and then it just didn't stop. I just didn't, didn't stop. You know, at 18, I was still eligible to play for the under-19s. So I'd go away with them. And then from 19, I'd go away with them with the first team. So I just was, I think I went to Belgium like seven times in like five months. And it just, it, it just never stopped. My life was just football, football, football. And then I'd come home, obviously go to club, club level at Liverpool. And then I would be off again at international. Yeah, it, it was just a very busy time. Yeah, it sounds it. It sounds it. Uh, and I'm, I'm presuming that uh, Liverpool certainly will be, I'm sure, up in the top uh, top divisions. Um, yeah. Yeah. But obviously at that point in when you was first starting out, was it, was that more of a contracted role? Or was that again just a bit more of a... Yeah, so so I started at Liverpool. I think I, well, I started at Tramier Rovers 
uh, funny you say that, Jason. When I first started, I was playing grassroots for boys in, in boys' level. You see, I was playing um, right. boys football in, in the village where I, where I grew up in, in Penneford in little old North Wales. And um, yeah. I... Um, I actually played alongside and I was on the same team as Tom Lawrence. Yes, I've, um, I've read. Yeah, yeah, we were best friends for many years. So um, he then got scouted for Man United and that was it. And he was gone you know, yeah. to Manchester and that was kind of it. And I, the Man United guy referred me to Tramia Rovers. So I started off there. And when I got to about 14, 13, 14, I think I had those Everton, Liverpool, Stoke and Crew sort of came in to sort of, you know, wanted me to... Um, go and trial so that's when I, I sort of my horizons boarded a little bit and I thought you know my dad took me everywhere like my dad it's like my biggest fan and he mm. used to drive me everywhere and stuff so we went to a few trials in a few places but being a Liverpool fan I think you know in the history of my granddad and stuff um, it kind of it sold me a little bit going there you know and I, and I was there from I think I was 14 till I was about 19 I think I was there a good five years so I broke into the first team. As soon as you're 16, you're eligible then to play, you know, full-time football, you know, with open age, shall I say. Um, mm. So as soon as I hit 16, like, I was in, I was, ah, oh, it was difficult because Saturdays the reserves would play. Sunday the first team would play. So Saturday I'd be in the reserves, but I could only play half an hour, 45 minutes because they'd want me for Sunday. So again, it was just, it was just a little bit hectic. They didn't want to overpower me at a young age, but, yeah, so I'd have half an hour, about well, 45 minutes, say, on a Saturday for the reserves. And then I'd have half hour, 45 minutes on the first team on a Sunday. It, it works something like that. Anyway, mm. yeah, so, um, yeah, just a busy, busy time at Liverpool. And then I had, um, unfortunately, it didn't quite work out at Liverpool. Money kind of came into it. And, you know, I was kind of still young and I still wanted to play. I still wanted to um it was, a, it was a season where we signed like Tash Downey and like Farrell Williams and stuff. And I still wanted to play because, you know, at the age of 16, 90 minutes was still important for me to get, you know, fitness levels. And I was still learning. I was still learning so yeah. much, you know. I learned so much by training with them types of people, you know. But unfortunately, I wasn't getting the game time, which, you know, which happens with youngsters. Even in a men's game, they go out and learn yeah. and they kind of, yeah, it does. And they, and they find their feet somewhere else, you know. And I went to Birmingham and, you know, I did a trial at City, uh, Man City, and I, kind of chose Birmingham in that sense you know to this day I do still wonder what had happened if I'd picked City I think I'd probably be in a little bit of a different position than I am now um, you know I think I'd have probably then shone on to something not saying that I haven't done great but I think I, if I had the decision to, sit, to, to take City I think I would have been a different place where I am now but there is no regret to that, you know. I wouldn't be where I am now, you know. And I think with women's football, I think you have to be realistic. And, you know, it's fortunate that I still do have a job that I can have a career in for the rest, you know, of my life. And that's really important, you know. Punditry and kind of stuff like that, it's not easy for women's football, you know. It's not not every women's footballer gets that gets them opportunities. So um, I kind of stuck to my work and I kind of did, I do still, you know, kind of put work up there with football as much as I can because, you know, when, once I hit 33, 34, possibly earlier, I don't know. Depends how my legs and my body will take that, you know, I still have got a career behind me that I can sort of that I can sort of settle on. Yeah. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, obviously you say about the punditry, I mean, it's, it's clearly, certainly in this country, um, it, it's creeping more and more, not just in football. I, I know in other sports, you, you'll yeah. still other sports and there are a lot more female commentators female officials are coming into it much more and yeah it's great i mean there's nothing there was nothing worse i think it was the world cup a couple of years ago and i think it was um for the women and it was one of the first times i'd seen the women um broadcasting and and commentating there's nothing two men talking about something that they don't really understand uh, and trying to make Uh, and it's like no, it, it it was great to see, and then obviously when um when Hope lost the uh, lost the England job, and obviously she she did kind of move a bit more onto the punditry side of things and was doing quite mm-hmm. a few commentaries, and I think she did do a lot for that uh, for that tournament um on, on for for BBC. It, it was it was a great insight, and then of course uh, only until recently, certainly in the England game, we've obviously had Phil. Um, yeah, who's literally, I think, just when a couple of weeks ago got uh, left, which yeah. of course we, is disappointed. Um, I must admit, again, uh, my apologies. I don't know a great deal about the Welsh women's uh, Welsh women's team. Oh, no, that's all right. 
I, I follow yeah. the uh, I follow the English one because they, they yeah, tend course, to yeah. right. Um, yeah. but it it does seem that it's something obviously that's ever growing, um, which is great. Uh, and at club level, obviously things seem to be growing as well. So hopefully, um, more and more opportunities uh, will, will become available. Yeah, I think uh, being kind of the age that I'm kind of at now, you sort of want to try and make it right for the pe- the girls that are younger. You know, like the girls that are in the academy at Derby, you know, I think it's important that we, you know, try and make them have the best future, you know, because we want them to be in our position, if not better, you know, because yeah. if if women's football is still going on the up, which I, I, I do think I do think it is, I think it did have a big spurt at one point. I think it was after, I'd say after the Olympics in London, I think, you know, people yeah, were yeah. people people were grabbing tickets to any event they could get to. You know, and because yeah. women's football wasn't as big as, you know, the cycling or whatever, it was, I don't care what I go to, I want to be able to attend an Olympic game event. And I think that's why we had the crowds of, you know, I think there was like 84,000 at Wembley for the final and stuff, you know, you don't get figures like that here, you know. No. And I think that's why now, you know, when the England women play at Wembley, you're looking at 75,000, 80,000 people. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's just because people genuinely enjoyed watching what they did watch you know they and I think having the Olympics obviously here did sort of drive women's football on to be better so I think you know my era a little bit you know bit shaded off you know I'm realistic though I'm very you know I enjoy playing football for what it is I don't do it for money I love it and um, a lot of us do do that and that's why there's a lot of passion you know you don't really get you know, the stuff that flies around Twitter about the men's, I kind of see it all and it's a little bit hazy. But I think, you know, some of the girls that come to the watch us, you know, the under 12s and the 13s, they sort of, you know, and they're on the sideline cheering. They sort of just strive to give, you know, we carry on, we keep pushing the club forward for these girls to have, you know, the best that they can out of football. You know, that we, we have had, but, you know, you never know in a couple of years, it could be full time, you know, at the level that we're playing at now. And if we can help, you know, any of the girls that are younger than us now that come to watch games, because you do create a good bond with them, you know. They, mm. they, they're they at games, of, you know, they want the picture taken, they want all that kind of stuff. Like, it's sort of like you idolise them. So if we could give something back, you know, to, to try and help the, the game going forward, that, you know, they could potentially have that potential back in. And, you know, clubs are working hard for that, not just for us now, but for the future of that club. You know, it's... Look, unfortunately, like for Files, you know, they didn't have that full backing. And it's not, you know, Duncan works really hard, but he doesn't just work for now. He works for the future as well because he yeah. wants this to last just as what, you know, as long as what the men's do. They don't just put the work in for a couple of years. You know, it's all year round that, you know, they're working really hard to kind of create that ethos that women's football is not going to die off and it's, you know, it's going to keep going up Yeah, the I, I certainly think so. I mean, Corey, um, you'll, you can come into this one in a second because you'll certainly know better than me. Obviously, the women's game in America, uh, the six, six-time six world champions, they, I think they wrote the book on how to play football in the women's Definitely. game, certainly. Um, I mean, just from, obviously, you hear various bits and pieces and obviously, I see it over here on the telly, certainly when England played the Americans, which we have done just recently a few times and, and didn't unfortunately do very well. Um, Mm -hmm. Obviously, the game over there, Corey, for the women, it's um, probably bigger than the men's. Uh, Yeah, and Jason, we were just talking about that, Hannah, before you came on, is, you know, they had the lawsuit with the equal pay that recently came up in. Yes. You'd probably say, yeah, the men's, the men's, you know, on the pay scale probably deserves a little bit more, but... In America, that's different because the women are so yeah. successful. It is a, such a unique case. And it's funny, yep. that, Jason, because my next question, Hannah, to you is, you know, what what's the future hold for you? Obviously, you're going to break all the Derby County women's scoring records. I know that. <laughs> when, you're done, when you're done doing that and you have a long and illustrious career with Derby, uh, what do you see your kind of next move? Would you like to, to try and, and, and play the game or, you know, what, what kind of the future hold for you? See what you've done now, Corey. You've now added extra pressure to my seasons at Derby. Now, <laughs> you take no extra to... pressure. We know you're going to do it. I've seen the goal scoring <laughs> record. Um, yeah, I think um, my next step. You know, I kind of did. I did do a couple of coaching branches back when I was at Liverpool, and they sort of like kind of pushed me to that. Um, not really sure. 
I didn't really I say enjoy it. It wasn't really something that I strive to kind of do, and it's never really been the forefront. It's what it is. It is just it's just the caliber that people take, you know. And I don't naturally have that feeling that I want to go and coach this, you know. I always like to kind of like help when you know there was um, when I was playing at my local, you know, people start knowing who you are and they kind of ask, can you come down to a couple of training sessions? And yeah, God, like I kind of love that. But from a football level, I don't really know where I would, after I hang my boots up, I don't really know what I'd kind of give, but I might feel different after it's changed. You know, I focus on my football now because I play it, you know, and if that aspect kind of got taken away from me, I might feel completely different and I might think, God, I need to go and get involved with, you know, I've got all this knowledge. I've got this, you know, all these, you know, all these places that I've been to, I've played for a country, I've paid for, you know, it might come back to me and think I want to share that and I want to go into schools or I want to, you know, I might, I might you know, I, I might look at it differently in that aspect, but I don't really, I haven't got the natural instinct to go and coach football straight away after I've finished football. But I say once it gets taken away from, once my body can't take it and it gets taken away from me, I might, you know, I might change that opinion. I might, you know, want to help schools. You know, I might want to do a local girls football team. You know, I want, I might do. Um, so yeah, I have to kind of see where the path takes me. I mean, I think I've got a couple of years left. Think being in capital letters, I'm pretty sure that I have. So I think I kind of see where it takes me after 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 I've done a couple of years. So it leads me to my last question for you, Hannah. Uh, before I turn mm-hmm. it over to Jason, is you know, obviously Jason, myself, um, we knew a little bit about Derby County ladies through the men's league, but as you probably yeah. realized talking to us, we're not as well ingrained into the women's game as probably what we should be as football fans. And, and that's on me. Um, and I apologize for that. But what would, <laughs> what, could, um, what would you say to our listeners and to other Derby fans and other football fans in general? What can they do to support um, and help grow the, the women's game, the Derby County ladies? What can we do as fans to help make sure that you guys can, can, can take that next level if, if there's anything that we can yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot more things that you could do that you may not know about. You know, we we there because we love it and we appreciate the fans that come down anyway. You know, we we sort of try and share stuff, spread stuff, Instagram. I know Andy, who runs the kind of media side to, to Derby County Ladies, he does so much behind the scenes that, again, people don't think that, you know, they don't realise, you know, he puts all the media out there. And, um, I just think people judge it before they see it. And I think that's where the red X comes into it and they go, nah, you know, they don't see a crowd full of play, a, crowd, a, a stadium full of uh, a crowd to watch these certain players. I think it's the ethos of women's football. Let's not go there. Women's that play, you know, they don't play in the stadium. They only play there once, twice a year. And that's, and that's kind of what we're kind of known for. I think, what I'd kind of say to fans is just give it one try, you know, just kind of give it one try. Bring your kids along, you know, bring young kids, young boys, young kids that even boys and girls that, you know, that are, say, true heart and heart Derby fans, you know, it's a little bit different because we can take the time out at the end of games to have photos, to sign stuff, you know. We're still part of Derby County just because we're not men's doesn't mean that we aren't part of the club and we don't know men's players you know it's I think they need to kind of realize that there isn't a huge gap between us and the men's just because we're not playing at these stadiums just because we're not getting paid like the men's do so I would kind of say just give it one try and if you give it one try and it's not not up to your expectations and that's you know that that's okay that you know that's fine but I don't think we like to be written off just because we're women at first you know bring your kids along you can sort of interact with us players, you know, signing stuff. You know, I've given boots to young kids before, you know, and they've been like the happiest ever, but not every, not, you don't get the aspect of that men's game. It's sort of down the tunnel kind of, and that that's just the way that, that's just the way that men's football is. You know, it's, you sort of dust your boots off, do your cool down and you're sort of inside and, you know, you say hello to your family and that's kind of, kind of it where we you know we take the time out at the end of the games because we realize that people are making the effort to come you know and watch and we sort of oh, uh, yeah we sort of we sort of respect that 
we sort of respect that, you know, that they have taken the tie out. So I'd say just give us one try and see what it's like. But don't, I'm not putting extra pressure on myself again. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll certainly be an advocate of it from this podcast. <laughs> uh, I, th- I think finally, uh, I've got one small point I just want to ask you and then one question as well. I think yeah. j- just mentioning there, um, I mean, something that obviously I've seen from being in and around Derby a lot is the emergence of um, the the following for the under-23s and under-18s men's teams. Obviously, yeah. they, they started playing at obviously more farm when it was farm. built. And, then, yeah. and now they're playing, obviously, I appreciate it. Obviously, the quality's got to be there to get to what they've done. But some of the things that certainly the under-18s have achieved and obviously the under-23s uh, so well in the leagues last season. But it, 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 op- to me, it, it opens uh, an opportunity that you may well be able to look into the women's game and go, well, you know, I've, I've went to one of the UA for the champions league um, fixtures at pride park. I mean, there was, yeah. okay. Like you say, not, not, not the 30,000 that's normally there week in week out at pride park. Yeah. But you know, there, there were, there was a, there was a fair few amount of people. Um, mm. And I think one of the points you made there, I think, you know, if you, if you're a fan of Derby County itself, that extends a little bit further than the men's team. It's certainly something that over the last three or four years I've tried to do certainly with the under 23s and the under 18s. Yeah. Not been yeah, to exactly. a, not been to a ladies game yet. I'll certainly try and yeah. get to one. Um, yeah, exactly. Because I think I think it's it, it just like you say. If if people show the interest, obviously I'm sure then more media will get involved, and you know th- that'd yeah. be great. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Like you, like look at the under twenty threes. You know, you have got some of them players like Max Bird and that that have come from there, and they straight into the first team. You know, like it's it's good that you know he's had he's done the sort of side to it where not many people turn up and now kind of look where he is. But imagine you as a young kid that took the time and the effort to go to the under 18s, 23s and be like, I met him. He gave me a pair of boots because you have that interaction at, yeah, absolutely. You know, at a lower, you know, and now he's playing first team and you're going to watch him when there's 30,000 people at Pride Park. And you'd be like, well, I've, I've watched him play first, you know, I've got his boots or I shook his hand or he signed my program, you know, and you people sort of forget that. And it's like, well, you could yeah. say it if he was there. Well, it is. It, obviously, that certainly as Derby County, uh, it, it's a philosophy that the club are pushing on with, certainly in the men's yeah. game. It's, and like you say, you know, one week, oh, well, you're not interested about watching the kids, but then when four or five of yeah. them come up, come up in one go, all four or five of them start, and then by the end of the game, the fans are chanting the name. Like you say, yeah. I, I think I think it's I think it's worth to uh, give yeah. them a go. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly, give the women's game a go. Uh, my final question: um, It's not necessarily yeah. about yourself, but it's more about the women's game. Um, yeah. Obviously, it's been mentioned in conversation a few times. Um, I yeah. really liked Hope Powell managing the England yeah. women's game. How long do you think it's going to be before women's takes a job at a higher men's level oh god uh, I, think it, I think it's coming I think it is coming you asked her an easy good, one there Jason yes yes yeah that's a it's a good question because you know I think a lot of people think about it and it's you know as soon as something becomes available I think people go ooh Ooh, they that woman has connections to that club in some kind mm. of way they used to manage there the women's side you think they go kind of the men's side I could say it would be in the pipeline, you know, because, you know, the people that are in contending to be the England manager, like, you know, there's Casey Stoney that's, you know, done what yeah. she's done. Or there's Jill Ellis even at America. She's in, I think, the pipeline to be England yeah. manager, you know, um, who says that she doesn't come she doesn't come over to the UK and wins the World Cup with England three times. And then next minute, you never know, like, Derby County want her. You know what yeah. I mean? You, you you just don't know, do you? No. I just think it's unfortunate because it's women's. The caliber is just not there to do it. And I, what I also think is, who's that men's? Who's the? What club is going to be the first men's club to jump and take the chance? Yeah. Because it it will take a lot for that first club to come around and go, right? Her, she's going to be the manager because you got you got to settle brains. You've got to you've yeah. got to get the men's to the men's players of that club to adapt. You're yeah. going to be managed yeah, yeah. by a women, and it will probably be, well. My my wife manages me enough. I don't need another woman managing me. And you're going to kind of get all that sort of banter side to it. But it'd be interesting to see what club takes the pump first, and then yeah. would it carry carry on? You know, it's going to take you know it's going to take a lot for a big club to do it. You know, um, to sort of take that pump. But it'd be interesting to see what club it would be. 
and would many more follow after it so it's a really good question which i'm finding really hard to answer but i do have an opinion of i think it's just going to take a big a club that's got i don't know a club that's got a big back in a big heart and kind of feels that they can adapt to that and whether it follows suit with many other clubs but it's also got to be you know the the candidates got to have you know somebody that's kind of smashed the women's game can they do any more is it possible that they can do any more are they just going to carry on or do they want to better themselves you know because it's not just about the club wanting the manager you know for women's managers to do it in a men's game again you've got to take the wrath you're going to have to take a lot of stick for probably doing it you know yeah it's going to take a good punt for a good woman strong woman to be able to accept the the role as well it's not just about the team accepting her you know she she's gonna have to, whoever that may be would have to adapt to that life as well you know because it's a little yeah. bit different because there'll be no doubt that she'll probably get a little bit of stick here and there but then if they do well she'd be the fans favorite after a couple of seasons maybe so yeah, yeah. it's a good question yeah, I think, I think you're quite right. I think it, it, it will take a, a, a punt from somebody, but mm-hmm. if it was if it was to work out, it could it could radicalise the oh, game. Oh, uh, she'd be without you know, doubt. crowned. You know, she'd be the crown jewels next. You know, but if yeah. it goes ter- terribly wrong, you know, you got to think about the aspects of it going terribly wrong for her as well. You know, so yeah, it's yeah. I think the club's got to punt it, but I think the it would take it. It would take. It wouldn't be. A light decision for the woman to take, and I know for a lot of men, they grab any sort of managerial role that they can kind of, you know, kind of grab and they get offered. But I think yeah. it would take a, sh- a strong woman to kind of accept that sort of yeah. responsibility as well. Yeah, yeah. no, oh, just, yep. good answer. Well, I think that about wraps it up. I think we've taken up far too much of your time, Anna. Thank you very much. I know you're all right, don't worry. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna. Appreciate all you do for Derby, appreciate what you're doing on the front lines, um, on the fight against. Oh, Cooper. cheers. Hopefully. Thank you. It's glad to see you safe, and, and hopefully we can speak to you soon when, um, again, when the when the league and season's back up and running. Yep, I appreciate that, guys. Yeah, I've actually I really enjoyed it. I hope you obviously both stay safe, and uh, um, hopefully we'll catch up soon. Hopefully, yeah, a few, not a problem. Few, few more goals on Italian. Um, maybe see you at a game or so, Jason. Maybe yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Tempted absolutely. You a, maybe tempted you a little bit, maybe. Well, yeah. what I'm going to do, Hannah, is next time I come over, because I come over every season to watch a few, oh, you? and Jason will meet, oh. and we'll meet up with you at a women's game. How about that? We will. Oh, we'll perfect. come. We will. I'll hold you to that one now. We will. That's absolutely. a promise. That is a right, promise. Perfect. Absolutely. I look forward Lovely. to seeing you both. But yeah, anything else you need, kind of guys, just, just hit me on Twitter or just let me know, and I'll be happy to help. We will. Thank you very much. We'll do. Thank time. you, Anna. No worries. Take care now. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Well then, guys, I think that pretty much wraps it up for this uh, very special episode. Um, It was fantastic uh, to speak with Hannah. Um, Guys, please keep your eyes out on social media. We have got some very exciting things in the pipeline uh, that we will be announcing over the next few uh, days, coming weeks. Uh, Me and Corey will probably get together uh, in the next couple of days and finish off uh, the podcast that we started this one came as a as a bit of an impromptu one um but of course we didn't want to miss up on the opportunity that we got to speak with hannah and try and broaden the horizons of this uh, new look podcast as we're as we're trying to uh, unveil it uh corey thank you very much as always i mean it was for me it was a great it was great to have a, a new guest it's been a while since i've had a new guest you were of course the first guest um and it does seem does seem a long time ago now but yeah to get somebody else involved it was it was really nice um, a very interesting insight onto a topic that I don't know enough about, and um, certainly going to keep my eyes out on the uh, on the women's side of things because I think it's uh, it's something that's growing. And as we all say, as we say, as I mentioned earlier, you know we're we're in it for Derby County as a club, not just as the men's team. So it it, it was great to get their input. But thank you very much as always. Yeah, thanks, Jason, and I'd just like to thank uh, the Derby uh, Hannah for taking the time and and, and Derby County uh, women. Uh, for for allowing us the opportunity to interview her and being very responsive to us, so we really appreciate it. And Jason, thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. I appreciate it. You're you're very most welcome, and yeah, I uh, I'll agree with your sentiments there. That's all, guys. As always, on the social media, we're on uh, Facebook, uh, which is Rams Review Podcast. 
Uh, Twitter is at RemsReview1. Uh, email is RemsReview at Hotmail.com. As I say, guys, subscribe, like, share it with your friends. We've got some very exciting things coming up. But for now, thank you very much and see you soon.